However enticing that this uh, title may be, I do, of course, will start with a couple of words on the journal, uh, the journal uh, that we are celebrating the 30 years anniversary of. And uh, first of all, um, it seems apt to say some words about the founding editor and the editor-in-chief. So the founding editor was Jona Alexander in 1993. Um, since and after seven years, he went on to really focus more on terrorism studies. I see he's still very active in the field in several institutions in the US. So, but in 2000, um, the editor-in-chief became Gudmund Tour Alfredson who's ever since, so for 23 years, has been a guiding light and inspiration for the journal. He is actually particularly well placed for this role as editor of a journal on uh, minority and group rights, also because of his wealth of experience at the UN. He uh, worked at the UN Secretariat for several years for the UN Working Group on Minorities and the one on Indigenous People. He then also later became a member of the UN Subcommission on the Prevention of Discrimination and the Protection of Minorities and um, also the chair of the UN Working Group on Minorities. He's also been active in the framework of the OSCE uh, in the, with the development of several of the, the recommendations of the High Commissioner uh, on National Minorities. And he has a long, long list of uh, human rights teaching positions in several countries of the world. I'm not going to even start to uh, mention all of these. So that was a little bit on um, the very important role of the editor-in-chief. Then let me say a few words on the journal. So the International Journal on Minority and Group Rights is devoted to the interdisciplinary research on the legal, political, economic, social problems that are faced by minorities, indigenous peoples, and related groups in all countries of the world, while having special regard to, on the one hand, human rights standards, but also to um, good governance guidelines and related areas uh, in this respect. Let me tell you a few more words. Uh, the group rights, it's important to focus on that. It's not just minority rights, it's also group rights with a broader, broad understanding of this notion of group. Uh, it's a, a segment of the society with relatively constant features like national or ethnic origin, religion, culture, language. So that clearly links to minorities, but it is broader than that. Uh, so also migrants and uh, peasants even. So it's, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of special issues that have been uh, developed, developed also to give you a better sense of that. Looking at the all countries of the world, um, I looked actually at the, the table of contents of, of most of the issues, and it's quite visible actually that from the beginning there was a broad attention for several, several regions of the world. For example, from the beginning articles on South Asia, India, Mexico, Rwanda, etc. So that uh, gives you uh, a bit of a, an idea. Looking at the question of the multidisciplinary angle, um, also that was very much uh, present from the beginning. Um, to give you an example, Ruth Lapidoth wrote on autonomy, potential and limitations. We have uh, an article on psychodynamics of ethnic terrorism, um, anthropological approaches to ethnicity and conflict, algorithmic humanitarianism, etc., etc. So I'm just uh, giving you some examples. And maybe also interesting to know that I think that might not be picked up by a, a lot of people. There have been quite some special issues of the journal focusing on particular themes. In the beginning, it was more de facto. It doesn't uh, the, the particular issue doesn't get called a special issue. But if you look at the content, uh, there's one focused on minority education, another on Sami. Quite meaningful ones are, for example, the two, one of the 2015 issues focuses on critical approaches to migration. There's one on ethnic free prior and informed consent of relevance to indigenous people, one on territoriality and language rights, it's, and war zones, also accountability in war zones. So you see, it's, it's a very, quite varied range of topics that are actually addressed in uh, the journal. Now, going to the more overall picture, it seems that the majority of the articles uh, that are present, that, uh, that are uh, brought to the journal concern Africa, and Asia. And so that's quite uh, striking with a lot of attention for the current situation in Ethiopia, also the Rohingya. Have, there have been several articles on the Rohingya groups. 
there are some articles on indigenous minorities in Europe and very few on America, actually. And the second point in terms of general development, it seems that lately there has been less attention for legal analysis and more for political science. And that brings me then more to future perspectives. Eh? The editorial board is basically uh, at a more general level welcoming more articles again with legal analysis and definitely also articles focusing on Europe and uh, the Americas that would be, uh, where, whereas we are of course welcoming the ones that are coming in anyway, but this is a particular area that we feel mm, we could uh, develop further attention there. And then I, lastly, before passing the floor, um, I would like to say a few things about a special issue that has been added this year. So there, this year we're gonna have five issues instead of four. The fifth issue to mark the anniversary with articles from several members of the editorial board. And I've noticed from Gudmundur that uh, the first articles have been submitted in that respect. Lastly, another point that I think may be relevant, we are uh, developing a book at the moment with the 15 most noteworthy articles that have been uh, published over the last 30 years. So uh, that is something to be, to look out for. Well, now, by way of introduction to our uh, lecture, a few words on Alexandra Xantaki. She is professor of laws at Brunel University London and um, has also written a lot of uh, articles on um, cultural rights in, in various um, issues related to indigenous people, to minorities, cultural heritage, multiculturalism, a very broad range of topics in that respect and making her a very apt special rapporteur in the field of cultural rights. She is also the member of the Master of Human Rights Faculty at Oxford. Uh, and something I do want to mark because I think it's really meaningful, she leads the Brunel side in an EU-funded project uh, on employing technology to push forward the integration of migrants. So I think that is a nice introduction to pass the floor to our esteemed colleague uh, uh, for to start our lecture, please. Alexander. Oh yes, one more thing guys, um, in terms of the Q&A at the end, um, for all those of you who are online, please use the chat function. There's a possibility for you to type things and I will then make sure that I make notes on that uh, and pass that to Alexander for the Q&A. Thank you. Please, Alexander. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Christine. And uh, it is uh, an honor uh, to invite me to give the public lecture for the 30th anniversary um, of the Yellow Journal, as we um, very affectionately, some of us call it, uh, the International Journal of Group and Minority Rights. Um, it is indeed the only journal that um, focuses on minority and group rights per se, and has made very clear, huge contributions to scholarship. Um, and, and I think that also the editorial, um, the editorial group have ensured um, that um, articles are very uh, rigorous and they um, have had impact on uh, indigenous peoples, but, um, but, but also uh, they're always very constructive um, of, of their um, uh, reviews. Um, I am particularly happy because I feel that I am among friends um, and, and among co-travelers in, in this academic journey. Um, Christine, I really enjoy her work and especially, you know, she has made such a tremendous contribution on, um, the, on integration in minority rights. And uh, Gudmundur Alfredson, um, in addition to being um, a, a, a scholar that has shaped my early understandings of the application of self-determination on indigenous peoples, I will never forget that he was al also the person that introduced me to the first UN Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Issues, Rodolfo Savenhagen, who employed me as his research assistant. So then I kind of strengthened my links with the UN and the rest is history and also present. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of other members of the editorial board are, are names that have 
um, really pushed forward um, the, uh, the the rights of uh, minorities and indigenous peoples. So I am I am absolutely delighted to to be here to mark this occasion, and also um, the the journal is thriving, and you know there are a lot of really interesting current articles and um, you know, very clear plans about the future. So today I want to focus on cultural rights and migration. And this is something that has been discussed um, before, you know, whether migrants should um, um, enjoy the protection of um, uh, minority rights. But I think it is really important to think of um, migration um, at the moment and the migration so-called crisis. Because in the debate on the so-called crisis and what are the solutions and how we can accommodate uh, uh, forced migrants, minority rights are completely sidelined. So they're not, you know, there's no discussion on minority instruments, there's no discussion on um, solutions that derive from uh, the minority protection. And I think that this is a very big uh, gap. So even, um, even those who accept that uh, migrants are certainly um, entitled to minority protection, um, they don't really link um, these, they don't really link minority rights and minority protection to the um, current discussion about, um, about migration. And I think that this has to do because we're all shocked at what is happening with um, um, migrants and, and refugees. Uh, we are shocked that we see that uh, boats are overturned and people lose their lives, whereas we um, um, discuss for days whether the Navy came on time or not. Uh, we are shocked that um, the, the basic principles of international law of accepting of the right to seek asylum is, is not being, um, is not being um, uh, respected. Uh, we are shocked at the level of bushbucks that, uh, um, that are happening and how states uh, very easily say that their borders are going to close because, quote, they don't have enough space. Um, and, and because we're shocked, we go first to these rights, you know, non-refoulement, the right to seek asylum, and prohibition of torture, etc. And, and I think that this is very understandable and, and, uh, and, and a very good uh, way of dealing with the current uh, shocking um, situation. Um, but, but at the same time, these people are also entitled to their, apart from their physical um, um, their, their protection of their physical world, also protection of their mental and and uh, identities, uh, mental world and identity, and this can happen only with cultural rights. Also, these people are here to stay. You know, these individuals are here to stay. So more and more, we're having individuals who came in 2015, and they're already staying. Uh, they're already here. Um, in in uh, uh, for example, my home country, Greece, already for. Um, uh, seven years, seven, eight years. So we are not talking about people who are just trespassing and they're just going to go somewhere else. Um, and finally, we keep talking about the indivisibility of, of human rights. So why, again, do we focus on mainly on civil and political rights with a little bit of, um, uh, of um, uh, living conditions, but also seen as um, prohibition of torture, uh, and we don't focus in all human rights? Cultural rights, I, I keep saying, is the Cinderella of human rights, but I think that the Cinderella of human rights um, are, is, is here to, to help um, the other marginalized um, uh, individuals, uh, the, the, the migrants and, and refugees. Um, also, I think that a reason why we, maybe the international um, uh, community, including scholarship, has been very reluctant to apply um, minority rights to the situation of, of migrants is because we're not really sure who we talk about when we talk about migrants. Um, and, and we're not really sure whether we also include uh, migrants in, the, in uh, the, the category of asylum seekers and refugees. And, and I think that this is again something that is being maintained for good reason by the, um, by, by the international governance also on asylum. Um, they really say that there has to be a clear um, separation, a clear distinction between migration and, and um, asylum. 
uh, which I understand, but at the same time, we are talking about forced migration, and refugees are also um, uh, forced migrants. Also, the European Court of Human Rights has said that uh, we are uh, the uh, undocumented um, uh, refugees um, are what a lot of us call migrants. So, you know, the, the definition between migrants and, and refugees is still not very clear. In any case, migration, whether it's migration in tra traditional ways or migration that we have seen, um, uh, we, have, we see currently, turns individuals from being part of a majority to being part of a minority, from being part of the mainstream society to being part of peripheral and often marginalized communities, and hence makes their cultural rights more vulnerable. Migration means that cultural objects of importance are often forcibly left behind, frequently because of the limitations of existing trade law. Um, migration brings with it the loss of important places, communities and relationships, tools and instruments. The rising costs of goods and services that impact on the ability to continue meaningful heritage practices. The loss of a broader supportive community that fosters intergenerational transmission and sometimes even resistance or oppression to continuing certain heritage practices in the new home country. So this is the reality of a lot of migrants. Of course, we should not forget that migration has very real positive effects as well. Um, cultures are dynamic and revisions that, that happen in the cultures because of the migration are always very welcome. The process of being open to other cultural frameworks uh, expands horizons, creates innovative ideas and theories through the fusion of cultural references and ultimately evolves cultures. Now what is really interesting is that when I say these words, um, several states have said to me that yes, I, they agree, this is what happens to migrants, but I'm talking about the societies where migrants exist. So these societies are fed new ideas and new values, and are being um, their values are visited by the migrants. So it is the host societies that also benefit from from migration. Uh, societies also experience changes in their cultural norms because of the newcomers. Um, they're also pulled willingly or not to face their own attitudes, their own values and ideas, and to renegotiate their cultural spaces. Such organic processes may create uncertainty and fear for, quote, the other, unquote, the unexpected and change, and can ultimately create resistance to more fused cultural frameworks. So the mixing of communities, contexts, and cultural resources that takes place through migration is certainly an enriching and dynamic exercise. And international human rights law does protect uh, the cultural rights of everyone. So somebody would say to me, why do we need to recognize the minority protection in order to protect the cultural rights of migrants? So we do have Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights um, that protects the cultural rights of everyone. We do have the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination that, um, that uh, ensures that there should be no discrimination, no racial discrimination in cultural activities and affirms that there should be no distinctions between citizens and non-citizens and also that states should take positive measures for the development and protection of the rights of vulnerable groups in the cultural field. We also have the instruments, political instruments, that come from, um, from um, asylum and migration uh, discussions. So the Global Compact for Safe, orderly, orderly and Regular Migration is on, of importance because it reiterates that refugees and migrants are entitled to the same universal human rights and fundamental freedoms. And commitment number 16 of the compact um, affirms the need of states to empower migrants and communities to achieve full integration and social cohesion. As part of objective 16 of the compact, they commit explicitly states to promote mutual respect for the cultures, traditions, and customs of communities of destination and of migrants by exchanging and implementing best practices on integration policies, programs, and activities. 
However, I believe that these are not adequate um, instruments and adequate protection, and we have seen this um, uh, as, as it unfolds before our eyes. I believe that in, uh, these instruments are not adequate, first of all, because they don't protect the added um, vulnerability that minority uh, cultural rights, um, uh, sorry, that migrants' cultural rights um, suffer uh, from, but also because we by our silence, we do not recognize the additional protection that these individuals should really have. And I think that the International Journal of Group and Minority Rights got it right. So from very early on, they have included in an International Journal of Group and Minority Rights, uh, migrant rights. So we do have the special issue in 2015. We have articles about the status of migrant women workers as domestic workers, uh, specifically in China in 19. We have um, talked about, the journal talks about uh, universal health coverage for undocumented migrants uh, in 2018, um, focusing on Spain. Um, and, and also uh, it talks about attitudes towards migrants. So. So the journal got it right. The journal seems to agree that migrants must enjoy the, the, the scope of protection of minorities. But state practice would have us still believe differently. Timothy Jacob Owens, uh, in an article in the journal, reminds us how only two state parties have currently elected to expressly apply the framework convention on national minorities to immigrant origin groups. And this is the Czech Republic and the UK. And other states are very reluctant, all other states are very reluctant um, to apply um, minority protection to migrants, and some of them are very vocal. Only last June in 2022, Germany sent a letter responding to the opinion of the Advisory Committee of the Framework Convention on National Minorities, saying that, quote, the Framework Convention does not define the term national minority. It is instead the responsibility of the individual member states to define the various national minorities using objective criteria. The Federal Republic of Germany did this with its declaration of the signing of the Framework Convention um, on uh, 11th of May 1997, uh, 1995. And later on, um, Germany says, the advisory committee's request that individual articles of the agreement be applied to specific groups of migrants, which given the clear definition of national minorities in Germany, is legally unfounded. So Germany believes that it is wrong that the advisory committee discusses rights of migrants. But this is completely wrong, and we know that this is completely wrong. The identification of minorities is, up, is not up to the state. You know, self-identification is one of the main principles of international law. Human agency in deciding one's identity is one of the major uh, principles or fundamental principles of human rights. And the United uh, Nations Human Rights Committee has noted early on that, um, with respect to Germany, that they will look at um, immigrants as well. Um, the lack of citizenship should not be an issue, and I think that um, this is almost settled now. The commentary of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Persons Belonging to National or Ethnic, Religious or Linguistic Minorities maintains that citizenship should not be a distinguishing uh, criterion. In 2005, so already almost 20 years ago, the UN Working Group on Minorities recommended that governments protect the rights of all minority persons on their territory, irrespective of citizenship. And the reality is that most of the migrants, asylum seekers and refugees come from groups in Europe that already existed. So we didn't see Syrians in Europe in 2015 for the first time. There was a group that was a Syrian minority. It's just that individuals, more individuals, came to Europe. And the same thing happened with Tunisia, Algeria, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Turkey. Um, these are the top states of origin of most of the migrants in 2020, as suggested um, by EU statistics. And so we didn't first, Europe, European states, did not first 
um, see these, uh, these, these communities coming in 2020. They came to already existing communities. Um, they have been concentrating in parts of Europe for a long time, and they have, uh, and, and in this respect, they are uh, minorities. Finally, we should not forget that the dichotomy between new and old minorities and the different treatment of the two categories has attracted criticism. So the commentary again on minorities, the advisory committee of the Framework Convention on National Minorities, and a wide array of scholars have pointed out that there should be no distinction between new and old minorities. And of course, Henrit in uh, 2008 noted that there seems to be an emerging consensus that new minorities should be considered minorities for the purposes of minority protection. Yet, although we international lawyers keep repeating that migrants are members of minorities, in this crisis of forced migration in the last eight years, as we experience it in Europe, with its incomplete list of rights, its vagueness and its gaps, the minority rights regime has been surprisingly absent from the discussions and the debates. Minority rights have been sidelined. I think this has to change. And this is what I argue for. So let me talk about the cultural rights of migrants and explain how the minority protection would make a difference. So migrants' cultural rights include access to cultural services and institutions. Cultural rights recognize the rights of migrants to access the cultural life. And this has to happen at the same level um, as the rest of the sections of the population. So here we're talking about non-discrimination. So we're talking about museums, galleries, and bookshops, important cultural institutions where um, uh, migrants should have uh, a, a real uh, entry point, should really be able, um, should have real access. And I think that this can be, um, this aspect of cultural rights can be um, served by general human rights. But when we come to participation of migrants in cultural matters and in decision making of cultural migrants, I think minority rights have a very specific um, uh, benefit, are of a very specific benefit. So the participation of migrants in any programs, discussions or measures that affect them is an essential part of cultural rights. And yes, general comment number 21 um, of 2009 of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights does uh, refer to their participation. But participation is a very fundamental aspect of minority rights. And we want these persons to participate not on their individual um, um, uh, 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 entity, but as individuals under collective capacity. So we don't want uh, the uh, token migrant to be in this board or in that board. We want them to be able to participate and even lead the exhibitions about migration, um, the narratives in exhibitions that uh, concern them, etc. And we still see in Europe and in North uh, America Exhibitions that happen about asylum seeking, about refugees, about, um, about migrants, and they still are the members of the majority that lead these exhibitions. And sometimes they even are the members of the majority, experts or not, who actually have the narrative. And so immediately migrants become yet again the object um, of um, uh, of the situation rather than an active subject um, of their own experiences, of their own narratives. So for this, you know, minority rights can, in these minority rights can really help. The need for the direct participation of migrants must be guaranteed in the cultural sector as well as in other sectors. The infusion of their values, philosophies and knowledge benefits the wider society and its economic, social, and political life. We have very good examples, and we have very good examples from Europe, but also from beyond Europe. So for example, example in the Dominican Republic, it is reported that uh, since 1992, there has been a new turn towards a decolonization discourse, 
uh, spread, uh, spearheaded by civil society and feminist organizations, intending to challenge the almost exclusive focus of the country on its Hispanic uh, heritage. This led to the recognition in 2005 of the so-called Giloyes, traditional carnival characters, as a UNESCO-recognized living patrimony. So acknowledging the heritage of the Afro-descendants who were migrants from the Anglophone Caribbean in the country's narrative. And we have a lot of other examples. The other aspect that, um, of cultural rights of migrants has to do with artistic freedom. So again, when we talk about artistic freedom, I think that you know, general um, international human rights law is um, uh, important. So again, we're talking about non-discrimination. Um, there is an un uh, underrepresentation of migrants in the cultural expressions. There is an underrepresentation of um, migrants in cultural life. There is an underrepresentation of migrants in your TV screens and you know in the cinema and in the theater. Um, a friend who is a, a, an actor, uh, he's Greek and he lives in London, and we always make a joke of how every time he's asked to take part in a film or in the TV, he's either going to be the Greek or the Arab or the Turk. Um, and, and, you know, very specific, um, very specific uh, tokenistic uh, approaches to migrant actors. So migrant artists face significant obstacles in assessing the appropriate resources. Um, and, and all these can be dealt by general, um, general human rights. CERT has been excellent in, in dealing with um, non-discrimination, racial um, uh, and, and racial discrimination. But when we talk about bias, conscious or unconscious, about what is good art, as well as priorities set by governments, for example, to promote national history or specific causes, in this, we do need the protection of minorities. So the narratives, who's going to set the narratives, who's going to lead the narratives, is really important. And so is the interaction, the interaction that is needed um, when it comes to cultural rights. And general human rights law is not very big in talking about interaction, but you know the Framework Convention on National Minorities is actually talking about interculturalism, and it actually um, uh, talks about integration. So it is very important that um, uh, in in this situation to be able to tap into the wealth of minority rights and minority protection. Creating common spaces where interaction happens is essential. So Barcelona is an amazing example of, um, of uh, a, a place, a local authority, that has thought very clearly about creating common spaces where migrants, uh, majorities, and minorities, and um, asylum seekers, and, and um, um, different parts of the population can meet and can really enjoy together the discussions and the interaction. Um, also, the Göteborg Opera and the Swedish Red Cross have collaborated in 2014 and 17 to organize a performance of the Swedish hit musical Christina Fren Duvemala, I'm really sorry for my accent, um, reinterpreted to integrate the experiences and songs of a group of people recently arriving in uh, Sweden seeking asylum. So you can see how the interaction is, is really important. And this interaction is very much um, uh, put forward in, in minority uh, instruments. This interaction is important in schools, it is important in libraries, um, it is important in common spaces. Very often I do give the example of um, my childhood. Um, when I was growing up in, in Greece, um, in my generation, the first book that people would read would be by a great author, Pinelope Delta. And this book, all the kids at around seven years old would read this book. In this book, the narrative was very much about how the um, barbaric Turks would slaughter the heroic Greeks. 
there was no discussion about the good parts of the Turkish culture. There was no discussion about um, Muslims and whether Muslims existed in Greece. So this was a very mono monocultural way and there was no interaction. So this was a very monocultural way that unfortunately continues to exist in many, many states. So just having the one example of the opera where you bring migrants in and us, me, talking to you about this as the exception goes completely against the minority rights standards that we have in international law and actually it goes against human rights. We have moved on from that. So it seems to me that scholarship has moved on but maybe state practice in a lot of states and even in states that are very proud publicly of their human rights standards um, continue to be quite um, back into what happens with migration and interaction of migrants. So this is another part where um, um, minority rights would help. The final part is that I find very difficult um, to, to, to solve is the rights of migrants um, as their ways of life. And I think that generally human rights um, um, have um, found very difficult to balance the rights of the cultural rights vis-a-vis uh, -vis other individual rights. And I think that this is why, at least this is the main um, argument that a lot of states would, would um, uh, give um, for not uh, being very eager to promote the, um, the, uh, the cultural rights of, of migrants. So I think that uh, talking about Europe, we hear very often about how the, the migrants have to um, respect, quote, our way of life. The Euro Europeanization discourse of human rights maintains and increases the artificial gap between us, the Europeans, who represent the noble values of human rights and gender equality, and the others. We, the Europeans, need cultural rights, often in the sense of access to high arts, whereas they, the migrants, claim cultural rights to preserve their folkloric, traditional practices. Populist media, politicians, and parts of civil society have joined the chorus about the alleged perils of migrant cultures. This is in stark opposition of the commitment of states in the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, which is to strengthen the welfare of all members of societies by minimizing disparities, avoiding polarization, and increasing public confidence in policies and institutions related to migration. Negative representation of um, migrants are the main engine of current efforts to introduce neo-assimilationist policies. The criminal activities of any migrant um, are portrayed as either an inherent part of their culture or the outcome of cultural values, their cultural values. Existing problematic cultural practices are singled out when it comes to migrants. Unacceptable hate speech is confused with freedom of speech. And ultimately, migrants are dehumanized, which leads to tolerance of discrimination and prejudice against them and suppression of their cultural rights and identities. Ultimately, that can lead to legitimization of widespread and coordinated rights violations, as has been seen by the activities of right-wing criminal organizations in several parts of Europe, South and North, East and West bias and prejudices, often covered under the repeated phrase, migrants have to adopt to our way of life, are being repeated. As if Europe has one way of life. As if I have the same way of life being Greek living in London with anyone else. And we even have in the EU this, um, uh, high, uh, this commissioner for the EU way of life. And, and I think maybe we should put an S so maybe we should try EU ways of life. In certain host countries, our way of life is considered the right interpretation of human rights, implying a kind of ownership of human rights by the host state. 
so neocolonialism all over again. And in this flawed basis, as, as Christine has said, integration, a concept and policy celebrated in the last several decades, is seen as a one-way route used to promote policies that gently assimilate migrants. We're not going to kill them, we're just going to make them um, different. Overemphasis is put on promoting the national identity and respecting the values of the whole state. Integration, though, what we forget is that it's not only the responsibility of migrants, but most importantly, the responsibility of states to ensure that migrants enjoy their cultural rights and intercultural interactions are promoted. And we see that in the minority instruments. We see that in the Framework Convention on National Minorities. So, but this is not something that is being discussed about. You know, this is not something that we discuss um, an instrument that we bring forward when we discuss um, the, the, the situation with um, asylum seekers and, and new migrants. And of course, this idea of illiberal practices keep being um, repeated. Um, concerns are frequently expressed that the cultural norms and practices of migrants restrict individual human rights sometimes, including sexual freedom, gender equality, freedom of speech, and individuality. On the one hand, the assumption of cert that certain forms of violence against women are cultural practices that cannot or should not be questioned is indeed deeply flawed wherever it comes from. For example, practices such as forced or early marriages and lack of education are based on imbalances concerning gender and sexuality, rather than simply being a reflection of cultural values. Brave Iranian women are currently showing the world that their oppression cannot be justified in the name of culture. Migrant women do not have to confirm forcibly to the cultural expressions of the majority of the whole state. But on the other hand, Simplistic and populist knee-jerk reactions have the opposite effect of what they claim to serve. Instead of promoting their rights, they treat migrant women as minors. They take away their voices in the name of libera liberation and deprive them of other rights, such as education and financial um, independence. International law has a very clear voice in this debate. There are specific guidelines that we, um, that, that we have. So any restriction of human rights has to be on the basis of legality, legitimacy, and proportionality. And we do have cases such as the Loveless case where the Human Rights Committee has talked about these issues. So this cannot be an argument to deny um, uh, migrants um, uh, rights. So where did we, um, where did our discussion uh, lead us? So what I have tried to show today is that um, migrants, including migrants who apply for asylum, benefit and should benefit from the minority protection of international law. They should benefit because they fall within the scope of minority rights, but also they should benefit because um, this discussion is very much, the, the, the discussion we're having about them touches very much on specific parts of the minority protection. I hope that I did prove that um, effective participation of uh, migrants is something where they can benefit from uh, minority uh, rights, minority protection. Um, the interaction, interculturalism, is another aspect of minority rights that migrants can focus from. Um, positive measures, but also this understanding of their rights as individual rights under collective capacity, what we have in minority rights, rather than as individual rights per se. And I think it is important to continue to say this and to continue to push forward. Even if you know, Germany does not, or any other state, you know, they don't really like it. I think it is important to um, push for the application of minority standards in these situations. Not only for the migrants themselves, and certainly for the migrants, 
if international lawyers are here, international human rights lawyers are here to deal with um, marginalization and vulnerability, I think it is our duty to continue to push and not to take um, a state's word that this is how they do things and they're not going to change. But I think also it is really important for the evolution of minority rights. Because otherwise, if minority rights do not have a clear and loud voice in current crises, when there are matters that involve them, then they become sidelined and they may become irrelevant. As an epilogue, I have a story to tell you. Last month, I was in, the United in a United Nations meeting together with a lot of other UN Special Rapporteurs. And there, a state delegate with a very high temporary role in the United Nations, in the human rights structure, repeated three times that states are the owners of the United Nations system. I understand why he, it was a he, I understand why he said that. I understand what he's coming from. I have studied international law back in the 70s, like probably he has. But states are not the owners of international human rights law. They are not the ones that interpret, they are not the ones that caution, and they are not the ones that push in evolving the standards. The reality is that minority rights have staled recently. States, some states, have managed to take a lot of the teeth of minority protection out. So we can see that from the minority protection structure. The International Journal of Minority and Group Rights continue to do just this, to push for, um, through knowledge and through expertise of the law, to push for minority protection to apply and be reflected upon in situations of vulnerability and marginalization. And I'm sure that it will continue to do so in the next few decades. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Alexandra. Now I am calling on all the people online also to type comments, suggest questions in your chat. I'm not seeing anything yet, so I am in the meantime, uh, while I'm inviting your thoughts and your comments, I let me, in my own words, try to recap what I've picked up, which of course, I'm very sorry, I'm probably not gonna do justice to the rich uh, <laughs> and very thought-provoking presentation that you gave. But let me thank you for reminding us about the importance of cultural identity for every human being. So cultural identity in terms of, as it is important for human dignity and thus a crucial component of human rights as rights for every human being, simply because you're a human being, so irrespective of status, and so def definitely also for migrants refugees, etc., etc. So it's very good to get that again, so the, the reminder of that. Also the reminder that, yes, there is um, a lot of important protection coming from general human rights and non-discrimination, reminding us of the work of CERD in that respect that is very uh, meaningful. But at the same time, also reminding us of the fact that, yes, but actually from the beginning onwards of the development of the whole human rights paradigm, there was an understanding that, yes, human rights are rights for every human being, but at the same time, there was a recognition that some groups of human beings were particularly vulnerable and need special attention. In 1965, we had served the Racial Discrimination Convention, Convention for, the, for Women, for Children. So, I mean, there was constantly also, or very early on, a singling out of particular groups of human beings that were considered in need of special protect protection because they were vulnerable in particular respects. And it's very good to remind us of that too. Indeed, there are special vulnerabilities, and you clearly showed us the special vulnerabilities of the migrants in this respect, thus uh, making them definitely also a group that is entitled for special protection. And then, uh, when talking about cultural rights, the obvious type of rights you would be looking at would be uh, minority rights. And so also thank you for reminding us of the crucial importance of the participatory rights of minorities, them being a part in decision making, uh, in any decisions of relevance to them, 
uh, them being the actors and not just the, the subjects, not just the objects when it concerns artistic freedom, questions of visibility, and also this whole question of interaction that needs to be promoted. And uh, also, you actually made it earlier, but I thought it was very nice. So the awareness that, um, well, migrants may benefit from being here with us, but we also, as receiving societies, benefit from the rich richness that the cultural riches they bring to us and the, the, the degree to which they make us question and thus develop our own understandings, our own values. Um, that was very, very, very rich and, then, and good to remind us of. And then, of course, also your whole point about the ways of life and the own ways of life of, of migrants and the way we are constantly, or the receiving societies are often emphasizing, well, they're just, you know, when they come to us, they should do as we do, right? They should just adapt to our ways of, of life as if that is the, the golden standard. Um, and you showed clearly the danger uh, of putting the emphasis on that, that they need to adapt that. You know, there's lots of st negative stereotyping and bias and prejudice going. And I, you didn't name it, but I want to link it to this very visible Islamophobia that is in Europe so prevalent and uh, all the negative consequences of, of all of that, uh, hate speech, dehumanization, etc. Uh, and how that plays into to that. And while also acknowledging you know, it's not that there are no constraints possible, but when there are constraints on human rights, there need to be damn good reasons to constrain them. And there are clearly the proportionality considerations and stuff like that. So also very nice to remind a reminder of that. Um, as I am not yet seeing anything, I just keep on talking, right? <laughs> so can I just please, say that please. I think that what I tried to what I what I try to, to do is to get back to basics and say mm. that you know minority rights and and human rights in general of course they go hand in hand with politics and you know kind of we try to push states to um, um, sign treaties on the basis of um, you know their profile in international politics etc but but minority rights and and uh, you know rights relating to migration have the focus has to be on the rights of these people um, so earlier you said about the project that we have, the Horizon 2020 mm -hmm. project that uh, we have at uh, Brunel University London, and, and this is about um, predicting um, uh, migration inflows so that um, we can become more ready to, to um, uh, integrate and, and to accommodate actually uh, these, these persons. And, and I'm really surprised how um, the discussion among policymakers in the EU is very much about security, mm. and and I'm really um, disappointed that the discussion is not about the rights of these persons, and this is where the focus should be. The focus should be on the rights. The, of course, there are other elements. There's the element of politics. There's a, the element of um, solidarity among EU states. There's you know so many other elements, but the focus has to be on the rights of these of these individuals and unfortunately um, this has been hijacked by the securitization debate yes well i think i do want to add one thing and i mm. think that because i think that's also part of the the difficulty for states to accept that migrants may qualify as minorities that is this vision that there are loads of positive state obligations going along hand in hand with the status of minorities and i think there it's also important to remind us that I mean, also as the advisory committee of the Framework Convention keeps doing, always inviting for a broad uh, understanding of the scope of the persona, so who would qualify as a minority, but going hand in hand with the understanding that, well, these minority rights are not identical for all minority mm -hmm. groups, mm -hmm. right? Because there's constantly, it's full of qualifiers, minority rights provision, where possible, where reasonable. So it's all about proportionality. It's, in other words, it's all what you can reasonably expect from a government in a particular situation. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly in relation to language rights, you see that very clearly, right? So the factors that seem to, can you, ha can you have the right to speak your language with public administration? Uh, language in your, I mean, mother tongue instruction, all of these kind of things. That is, that would require quite some investment, and there are factors like traditional presence, presence, territorial concentration matter. But again, you also highlighted very clearly. Yes, yes, but this traditional presence, how far do you stretch that? Because these people have been around for a generation or two, or a basis of them, right? 
And so the language was around. And so if you look at the numbers, there also maybe, maybe, just maybe, there would also be sufficient numbers to justify investments in that respect. But I think that's lost out of sight. It's like when they, when they talk about the status, it seems that it's this overwhelming idea of Ooh, all these obligations coming at us, and do we want these extra obligations? It's this, the, the fear of that, I think, if maybe we focus more on let, trying to let them go of the fear and showing more, no, it can still be modulated. It's all what can reasonably be expected, that maybe we can start you know, talking to the right people in the administrations, we can start convincing them that it maybe it's not such a bad thing and that the focus should be on again, well, yes, uh, it's about rights, fundamental rights of human beings and the focus should be on rights and not on accepting and limitations and not granting the rights, while at the same time showing, well, there's no need to be afraid of what's coming at you because there are these typical proportionality considerations. Mm -hmm. I think that just having an open conversation about that, and maybe I don't want to be too optimistic, but maybe that helps, because I think it's often this this fear of states that, ooh, there's this black hole of positive state obligations coming at us when we accept the status of, 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 of minorities. So I think, I think yeah. you're right. I think, I think definitely you can see at the international level at the moment, the, the climate is very polarized. Mm. So there is, an, and this is also um, reflected in minority uh, issues. So there isn't a real discussion. I think that you know, 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, there, there was real discussion, and this is how we ended up having the, um, you know, some some evolution. But but I think that now there is, um, the 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 states are quite polarized, mm -hmm. and that's why there is no real discussion. Okay. By the way, I'm asking the tech guy. Am I missing something? Because I'm not seeing any typing. Do you see anything? <laughs> You don't, okay. So no, it's okay. It may be that I'm just not seeing anything. But I've asked, uh, there's a question from the room. Please, yeah, by all yeah. means. Uh, hi, yeah, I don't know if you hear it, Yosha. Yes, do speak up, yeah, but yeah. I think maybe you can come a bit closer, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, so my name is Katarina Hertel, and I work as a woman as a federal union of the European yes. nationalities, and I also do some research on minorities in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it was very, very interesting. I, I agree with your point, uh, and... Uh, um, by being engaged in research, but also working in the practical dimensions, like working, uh, like on lobbying minority issues here in Brussels, you know, I see that uh, there is uh, one debate in research, you know, how it should be, and then there is a little bit of a different reality, you know, that uh, is we face every day for working minority business, so to say, yeah. And um, I wonder, you know, because I, 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 I do agree, as I said, with, uh, with your messages, and I think it's really very important to pay attention to and to, to promote this um, uh, as a protection of cultural rights of, uh, of migrants based on this collective uh, identity, collective entity, as you mentioned. Uh, and uh, when I look, for example, at the, um, uh, the war in Ukraine, yes, and the consequences that uh, so many minorities have been squeezed out, uh, um, uh, it impacted so many communities, you know, by the, by the military operations, and um, uh, been displaced, uh, and now in different uh, parts of the EU. So I wonder, you know, um, uh, in the practical dimension, because you come from the EU system, um, uh, what, what can be the mechanisms, for example, for those minorities who ended up uh, in different corners of the EU uh, to actually uh, be entitled and to exercise those collective rights, you know? Because uh, I see so many challenges to minorities' identities in the context of this new security crisis in Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, the securitization of the topic is enormous, yes, but also on the practical level, I also don't think that it's so easy and uh, you know, uh, for example, for the EU Commission to establish certain mechanisms, you know, so how can that be done, you know? Um, where, where shall we start, you know? How to link this uh, yes. uh, right messages uh, to, to, to the practical kind of policies which, which are very much uh, needed at the moment. I think that's a really interesting and very topical, but also very interesting um, question. And it, and it is linked very much to my um, role as, as the UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights. So um, my mandate, uh, my office is, is very worried about um, the, the situation in Ukraine. From the very beginning, um, I, I think that I was the first Special Rapporteur that um, uh, issued a statement that said that um, the, the, the war in Ukraine, it's illegal and, and it's unjustified, 
but also it is based on uh, 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 it, it is based on an issue of cultural identity. Mm -hmm. So the Russian Federation denies the right denies the right of the Ukrainian people to their identity. So you know they kept saying that no, they're not. Uh, different to us, and you know they have um, there is no kind of separate Ukrainian identity. So this was the first time that y y you know very early on we we realized that there was an issue relating to cultural rights. Um, but at the same time, we have always uh, been very kind of um, uh, sensitive to the destruction of cultural heritage, and as you said very very um, eloquently, the destruction of cultural heritage. Um, is um, of course Ukrainian cultural heritage. We do know now that there are more than a thousand um, uh, uh, objects uh, of um, cultural heritage that have been destroyed, buildings and objects. Um, and this comes from you know the Ukrainian cultural heritage, but also migrant and minority cultural heritage, including Russian cultural heritage. And we do worry what's going to happen when um, this war is going to, to finish, what's going to happen in the next phase. Because in the next phase, what should happen is that all of these um, parts of cultural heritage should be uh, preserved. Um, but of course, after such a big ethnic, uh, such a big conflict, after such a big uh, illegal war, um, I do wonder whether the, the Ukrainian state will understandably be quite reluctant to preserve and, and protect uh, the cultural heritage of, um, that, that is not Ukrainian. Now when it comes to the minorities, and, and I think that this goes the same with the minorities in, in Ukraine, we have to be very open that at some stage these two um, notwithstanding the, the illegality of the war and the terrible, terrible suffering that has caused, at some stage this region will have to continue to leave the one next to the other. And I wonder whether the international community is doing enough to allow the traumas to be somehow um, um, made more... Um, um, made uh, be realized and, and be identified but at the same time also find ways to move forward and and we have seen what this happens if we go to extremes in the Balkans we have seen this in the Yugoslav war we have seen what happens when you know after the war finishes and the different identities cannot find a way of living together and I'm very worried about that. When it comes to Ukrainians in, in uh, Europe, if, if this is what you were talking about, yes there is another issue there but I think that Ukrainians in general, at least the way it has portrayed to, to me is that they really want to go back but they just want to go back to a place where they're not, you know, their lives and the lives of their kids are not going to be under threat. So um, uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to see the international community um, and the, the states, European states, giving a lot of um, help to Ukrainian uh, migrants. At a different level, it makes me wonder if the, these resources and these possibilities were there all the time. Why did we not offer them to Syrians and to Afghanis and to other uh, minorities? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, please. Could you speak up? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. So, uh, the recent incident happened in uh, Greece, like Pyrrhos. Uh, we heard there were more than 400 people missing and more than 100 people identified as dead. So, and um, uh, there is a lot of shipwrecks that are happening in India to the Italian borders. But what EU is doing, like the recent EU submit, uh, we had this uh, topic to be discussed. But how how the EU can stop uh, losing the life of these people? Yes, I wish I could give a solution to that. <laughs> I think a lot of people are trying to give solutions to that, and I, I wish I could give a solution to that. I think that... Um, I think that... Um, 
the international community has to become more more um, sincere. Um, there should be no demonization. I think that Italy, Greece, Spain, Malta have taken a lot of criticism, completely rightfully so, but at the same time they're the ones that get you know all the all the inflows and it's easy to kind of claim to, to blame the ones that you have pushed to take the, um, uh, the, the all these people without a lot of help. At the same time, I think that these states should uh, realize that um, there are specific standards that, that they have to they have to respect. Um, at the same time, we have to discuss reasons why we have so many people who want to leave their they, they feel that they have to leave their homelands. What did the global north do to these people? For them to want to abandon their cultural objects, their cultural resources, their families, and go somewhere else. And these people should also look at themselves and and ask themselves what they have, uh, how they have created these uh, very difficult positions back in their own countries. So I think that a lot of different elements have agencies. And I don't think that we go anywhere uh, forward if we blame, you know, the other ones. And and I see a lot of that happening. And I don't see uh, governments and individuals and uh, etc. taking responsibility of of their role in in all this mess. Essentially, I think that international law standards should um, should. Um, be respected and at the moment I think it is a huge wound to all of us international human rights lawyers that so easily international law standards binding customer international law binding uh, provisions of international law are so easily disrespected um, and I think that a lot of us uh, feel that the credibility of international human rights law has um, has has been uh, minimized a lot through this mess. In the meantime, that has been. Uh, is that okay? Is that okay for you? Right. Thank so you. Okay, but still, I'm just wondering, Please. like, why you is like uh, discriminating with like the, uh, like you said, like the Spain, Greece, and Italy, but uh, it's a common problem for the Europe. But they are just discriminating, like it's only the uh, problem of these or. No, so I'm just wondering, like, the, I think Hungary and Poland, yeah, Hungary and Poland have uh, pushed some amount of money for these to, you know, to take immigrants, but it's not a solution, because if you are not willing to take the immigrants, they will die in the streets. So thank you. Really thank you for your comments. You know, a lot of, a lot of truth there. Yes. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, there has been a question from the, the online, someone online, Stefano Stavro says, uh, what are the implications for the division of labor between monitoring bodies like ECRE and the FCNN? That was more related to questions of language rights, but mm. nevertheless, so he's, he's wondering about that. Stefanos, if there's something you want to add, please type. <laughs> I'll give this uh, to you. You are the expert in uh, at the European level. No, but I mean, um, Stefanos, what exactly do you mean with the implications for the division of labor? In what respect is that in regard to the language rights? It's unclear to me. I think that in general what we can say, yes, please please come back and yeah, explain the, the question a bit more, but I think that in general it is, it is fair to say that uh, there are a lot of monitoring bodies uh, the, uh, you know, at the international level, at the universal level, and then also at the European level, and, and it seems to me that you know, some states state spend a lot of resources trying to you know, kind of uh, adhere uh, to all the obligations they have, and especially mm -hmm. when it comes to small states, it must be very difficult to, um, uh, it, it must be very difficult to uh, um, fulfill all these obligations. If Stefanos, I thought Stefanos yes, came back? Stavros, yes, Stavros, not yet. Not okay. yet. So if, if, um, if the um, person came, uh, uh, did not come back, I just want to say that there are 
differences, not only in division of um, uh, labor, but also in in uh, understandings of international human rights law uh, among among uh, different organizations. And since I took on the role of the special rapporteur, um, I, I have become only too aware of this. Um, so, you know, the, although we talk about the same issues, we see issues in different ways. But I think this happens also with um, international lawyers in general. And, and I encourage that. But what I do encourage is dialogue. Mm -hmm. There is definitely a lack of dialogue among um, treaty bodies and general monitoring bodies. Well, I just wanted to say that to some extent, you do see they take into each other into account, right? I mean, the EU is doing that in an event for like one, it's a, you know, uh, checking the c candidate countries, it's looking at what ECRE does, what FCNM does, OSCE, it looks at these different bodies. If you look at the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, far from that there's no criticism possible, I would be the last to say that, eh? it's all fantastic, but there is also substantial attention to ECRE, like I was just reading the last couple of judgments I was reading, there was a reference to reports of ECRE, there were re also references to the FCNM. So it, it is not that there is no judicial dialogue, if you judicial in the broad sense of the world then, but it is it remains so that each um, monitoring body has its own mandate, right? Its own reference point. And then it's more kind of an invitation to take interpretation by other bodies into account in its own work. And it's 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 never binding for that other body. It's more a question of willingness to consider uh, the interpretations of and the, the factual data as well that have been put forward by these other bodies. But it, it's, I don't, I'm not, ah, Stefanos, he's come back, he's come back, wait, wait. Um, that was about the language rights, yes. So I find Professor Xantaki's approach pragmatic and useful. There is the question of resources. Geographical concentration will become a major issue. Yes, that is also, as I said, right? Territorial concentration is a question, and I think that was related to how you started off with this uh, question of small, uh, small villages versus um, mm -hmm, doing mm -hmm. something in big cities. The numbers, yes, the numbers. But of it is they did it, so. It's the both the numbers plus territorial concentration. Yes. I think we both recognize it as being relevant. The point is also like. If you look pragmatically on the, the ground, you need to take into account that there are already uh, Syrians, for example, there is a community already there. So numbers are adding, concentrations are becoming bigger. So in that respect, I think that's what we were discussing earlier. Uh, so indeed, we completely agree that it matters how many and how concentrated the different groups are. But of course, yes. One more thing. I am. So easier to subsidize language rights in a few villages, more difficult, yeah, so that's what I said, in the suburbs of I think I think you're right. At the same time, I think education has a b very big role to play in this respect. So, you know, um, uh, teaching a, a, a multicultural education is really important. And I think that very few states have managed, even, you know, in 2023, to do this. So, you know, getting to know, so maybe, yes, language, the state will not be able to accommodate all languages, and I think that this is something something that we have, you know, we have realized and we agree, but there has to be some steps that the state can take. So maybe, for example, funding for um, minorities themselves to actually um, uh, promote um, their, their language or uh, finding different uh, innovative ways. But, but definitely education can ha have elements of minority uh, uh, past and language and and uh, histories as much as majority so i think that you know we shouldn't see issues completely um different for, separate from one another if language cannot be accommodated language lessons okay but let's find another way to promote cultural rights i think you know the, the this is important but thank you stefan thank you so much thank you stefanos um Yes, <laughs> it would be nice to have you here as well, absolutely. I have another question, Veronica Giza. Uh, thank you for the interesting lecture. Professor Xantaki, could you say a bit more about your work as a special rapporteur? Do you work with human rights NGOs, public bodies, or can individuals also reach out to you, for example? So individuals can definitely reach out to me. This is what my role is and I am, I am delighted when, when this happens. So as the UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, um, it is a role that um, uh, is for six years. 
uh, so three years and then renewable for another three years. Um, and uh, it is an unpaid role. Um, and what I have to do is I have to promote and um, uh, uh, help capacity building in, in cultural rights, uh, mainly through uh, three tools. The first tool is two thematic reports um, every year, one to the um, Human Rights Council and one to the UN General Assembly. Uh, this has been so far on uh, rights, cultural rights of migrants uh, and also on uh, development and cultural rights, two reports. Uh, the second report is being prepared as we speak uh, to the UN General Assembly. This is the first so, so thematic report. The second one is I go to official state visits. My first official state visit was in Germany last year um, and I discussed with um, uh, states and uh, state officials and uh, non-governmental organizations uh, the, uh, the situation of cultural rights in the state. The next um, uh, state visit is, is planned to be Chile in uh, end of March 2000 um, next year. Um, and the third one which I find really interesting is um, I uh, everybody from the civil society, NGOs, uh, individuals, etc sent me uh, even an email where they talk to me about uh, and they provide evidence of um, um, alleged violations and I enter into a dialogue with uh, confidential dialogue with the state and then if the state does not respond or does not respond in, in the way that I feel is um, uh, in sync with current standards of international law, I can I go public and, and I talk about this state. And I think that this is you know, the third aspect. It's, it's a very interesting aspect. I work very closely with, um, with NGOs uh, and I think that if I may say something um, about this specific topic, when I was creating the topic on uh, migrant um, cultural rights of migrants, I was hit by the lack of interest of uh, NGOs to provide evidence and, and work and um, help in this respect. So cultural rights are still, as I've been saying, the Cinderella of human rights. So a lot of NGOs dealing with migrants could not see the reason why we should focus on cultural rights. Um, so for example, the UNHCR does not, does not have a very clear plan on cultural rights of migrants. Um, uh, the International Migration Organization was very helpful, but again, very helpful. But again, they didn't, you know, they have, they don't do a lot of work on that. So, you know, this was one aspect. But also, NGOs working on minority rights uh, were a bit reluctant to work um, about to to talk about these new migrants. So I, I thought that that was a very interesting, I didn't expect that. I expected that because this is an issue that I feel very um, passionate about and because uh, various migrants themselves have told me uh, and asylum seekers have told me how this is an important aspect of, uh, uh, of their everyday life that is not being respected. I thought that uh, people would be very forthcoming. And I was very surprised that minority rights um, organizations were not as forthcoming as I would have hoped for. So just to answer very um, in, in very short, I would be delighted, I am delighted always to work with NGOs and civil society and individuals. Thank you again for, for these questions. Um, any further questions? Yes, please. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Michele Dadetta. I'm working for the Joint Research Center of the European Commission and I'm researching the right of access to and enjoyment of cultural heritage uh, at the Arturo Center of the University of Geneva in uh, parallel. Um, so when it comes to strategic litigation, let's say also, I mean, this soft uh, monitoring, let's say, is tools uh, that uh, the UN system has, mm, where do you see the possibility in the vacuum, maybe, also of uh, resources as well, financial and human resources, of other human rights, like, for instance, uh, the protection of mental health and uh, human dignity, that is uh, something that is related to a lack of encroachment of cultural rights. So how can you see the subsidiary role of other human rights, including this, 
And this maybe comes, I think, uh, from their extensive experience uh, with indigenous peoples that obviously are a particular sector of uh, some societies and we cannot extend all the categories that are uh, related to, to them to other sectors of society, but this link with the mental pain and anguish when cultural rights are violated. How do you see this also? The second uh, uh, example is that of the al Mahdi case in case of destruction of uh, cultural heritage. So there are also the local communities in, those, in that case where we recognize the mental pain and anguish and so from obviously from a criminal perspective uh, recognize certain rights. So, I think that's very interesting. So let me just um, kind of several several things to talk about here. So first of all, um, University of Geneva are doing some excellent work uh, when it comes to cultural uh, cultural heritage and protection of cultural heritage. Um, but um, um, this is the first issue. The second issue is you're talking to me about the um, the, the cross fertilization among human rights. So the good part and the bad part. When it comes to mental health, I think that this is something that you know cultural rights and cultural identity um, can can definitely be linked to um, the to mental health issues and and uh, the right to an adequate standard of living. Um, uh, my colleague Colin uh, Luoma is is uh, working on this um, uh, and and is bringing the. Um, at Brunel University London and it's bringing the issue of uh, indigenous uh, peoples as well. Um, so I think that it is a, an excellent way forward and uh, we can take examples from indigenous peoples, very much so, and we have examples very clearly. My problem is that now we focus so much on indigenous uh, peoples and cultural identity, which I fully uh, agree and, and you know I've been writing on this and I've been working on this. But we focus so much on indigenous peoples that it's as if we use them you know, to cover up the, the, the mental um, uh, uh, stress that minorities and members of minorities face when it happens to losing their cultural heritage. So we do a lot of work on indigenous rights and, and cultural um, and, and loss of uh, culture and cultural heritage, but we don't do as much work on the rights of minorities and the loss of cultural heritage. So I think that, you know, this is something that we have maybe to rebalance. Um, so I think that there are excellent uh, connections with human rights. So I work very closely at the moment with the right to development and, and uh, cultural rights. And at the moment there are several uh, human rights, um, sorry, several NGOs uh, civil society, but together with UNESCO, we push forward f this idea of cultural development and of a of a cultural dimension of the of um, uh, of sustainable development. So this is something that is becoming a little bit like a snowball since I started, and I think that you know there is a summit, uh, a world summit on SDGs in um, September. And uh, we've been trying to put the cultural dimension of development there as well. Um, and and uh, I think that's important. But there are other rights. The problem is that cultural rights have not, unfortunately, have not yet acquired the same position as other human rights. So by linking them all the time with other human rights, we deprive their own standing. So what has happened, for example, with artistic freedom? Artistic freedom, even, even um, uh, NGO literature and, uh, and uh, art councils literature, keep going on about artistic freedom as part of the right to expression, whereas they don't see it as part of the right to expression and, most importantly, cultural rights because they have to do with creativity. So although I do understand there are all these links and I really want to pursue them, at the same time, I am very eager to push forward for the visibility of cultural rights. I think that if at the end of the six years I have something positive to, to contribute, is to have cultural rights more visible um, at the international human rights arena than they are at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any further questions from the room? I'm not seeing um, further comments here in the, in the written in the chat either. Um, 
you're the, uh, maybe you have another question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, no really. it's okay. Well, I think maybe you want to have some concluding words. Um, so far as because you've, of course. you've got your very clear message or yes, yes. but we have concluding Yes, uh, I, I can't believe that there are people who joined us in the middle of um, you know the summer in such <laughs> a beautiful day uh, to talk about um, uh, migrant rights and this gives a lot of hope uh, and a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, confidence in, in the future of human rights um, and, and minority rights. Uh, I think that what is important is to, um, what I would like to say is that uh, cultural rights, uh, as I have said, have been sidelined and, and we need to mm -hmm. give them more central position. And um, uh, the current uh, debate on forced migration is one area where cultural rights of minorities um, have a very clear contribution to make. And, and I hope uh, that um, uh, more visibility is going to uh, is going to be possible um, in order to help solve the the suffering mm -hmm. of um, uh, current forced migrants. Thank you very much. In this respect, uh, seeing that you also already uh, edited a special issue of the journal on minority and group rights, maybe there is room for another special issue on Absolutely. cultural rights. Maybe with the link with sustainable development. That, that's I, would yes. I would be delighted. I would be delighted. Good Mundur, <laughs> write it down. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so let's. Uh, this is a beautiful moment to end on this uh, nice perspective. You can all look forward to another special issue from Alexandra, and in addition to all her very important work, it was a pleasure listening to you. All the the vision that you've got clearly for your mandate, and we look forward to seeing more of it in the years to come. Thank you very much, and I also want to thank, of course, the public here and online for indeed spending time with us while it is a very beautiful summer day, I think in a lot of the European countries at least. So thank you very much and hereby we can conclude this session. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.